Netflix. Shares are sinking this morning despite signs that its ongoing effort to crack down on password sharing is paying off. The streaming giant adding 5.9 million new subscribers in the second quarter. That's a lot better than estimated. But that growth was not enough to distract investors from the company's revenue miss or weaker than expected forecast. Mark Mahaney, Evercore ISI Senior Managing Director and Head of Internet Research joins us now. Steve Sosnick, Interactive Brokers Chief Strategist, is still with us as well. Mark, um, such an interesting story here. Also interesting that they raised that free cash flow forecast for the year because of the strikes. They're not going to be spending as much money on programming, but um, one would think eventually they'll spend it. But what, give us your sort of big picture take, though, on Netflix to kick us off. Well, we had an expectations correction, and that's what's going through the stock now. I think it was down as much as 8 or 9 percent. It's down 6 percent. But expectations were super high. I think of all the companies I look at, you know, if I include Amazon or Google or Meta, this had the highest expectations. And they were well above where the street numbers were. I think the buy side was looking for materially higher sub numbers. They were met in the... Um, in the June quarter, but they weren't in terms of the guide and revenue came in a little light. And so for a stock that's you know, had such a huge run, uh, you're going to have these kind of corrections. Then the open question is, is it a fundamentals correction or an expectations correction? In other words, are fundamentals getting weaker? I think they're getting stronger. Um, the one issue that we all need to really resolve if you want to buy the stock is, do you believe that ARPU, revenue per user, is going to continue to rise? I think it will. It's just a matter. I think it's going to be a long runway of growth. I think you're going to see acceleration for a year or two in that uh, key metric. Uh, password sharing is working. And um and it's showing up in the numbers. And the ad support of business really is not yet working. At least it's not showing up in the numbers, but I'm pretty sure it will. And so you still got these nice two growth drivers of what I call growth curve initiatives. I uh, like the stock and you can buy it at a reasonable peak gap PE multiple. So it's still along for us. 550 is what we think it goes to. So Mark, where it is with the password sharing crackdown, are you satisfied with that? And then how long do we expect that to take and where it could you know, potentially even impact the numbers in a negative way. I think we're beyond the point where it's going to negatively impact the numbers. It's possible when they first rolled it out in Canada earlier this year, there was evidence, tentative evidence that it was causing a spike in churn. That's what caused a real correction in Netflix shares earlier. But then they got through that. And what happens with the password sharing rollout is first, there's a little bit of a negative reaction because it's kind of perceived correctly. As a price increase, the Mahaney household, our Netflix budget is going up because I've got uh, you know kids at uh, college who've been using my account. Uh, but um, uh, so that is perceived as a price increase. But what seems to be happening is that that churn to churn to increase uh, time is actually shrunk really quickly. Like a lot of people are, are agreeing and signing up for their own independent accounts. And by the way, it helps that you have this six dollars and ninety nine cents offering. That's pretty inexpensive. In fact, it's downright cheap for a month of uh, Netflix entertainment. So I, I, I think what you're gonna have is you ask how long this will take to really build up. My guess, our guess is that if there were 100 million borrowing households, maybe about a third of them will probably either get their own account or, or will be paid for by their host account. And we'll have that number, it'll probably be fully fleshed out in kind of the next three or four quarters. You know, it's funny. My my Netflix spending has gone up for the same reason. My wife buckled and gave the kids, gave you know, bought the kids <laughs> the cheaper accounts, which I think, Correct me if I'm wrong. I think that had a lot to do with the subscriber growth, because but there were lower margin subscribers because there were add-ons to the household. But the question that I really I'm wrestling with is how will the strike affect them? Will it? I can I can come up with a scenario where it helps them. Obviously, they said it'll improve their cash flow, um, and I could also come up with a scenario where it's really helpful in the sense that all right, there's nothing new coming out, so I'll I'll go back and binge stuff on Netflix. The flip side is they don't have any new content either. Where, where do you fall on that? Well, I, I think the longer the strike, the worse it is for all of the studios and the uh, worse it is for Netflix. I mean, they may have a near term buffer in that um, they tend to produce shows well in, well in advance of when they were released. So their content slate between now and the end of the year, their release slate, that's pretty much all in post-production phase anyway. So the writers and the actor strike doesn't impact that, but it's going to impact the slate that was expected to come out in the first half of next year. So that's, um, you know, so it is an issue. It's an issue for all of them. And uh, there may be a small near-term competitive advantage for Netflix, but long-term it's something that they need to get resolved, you know, for, for Netflix not to have a hole in the content, um, in its content rollout. 
not in order not to have that hold, they need to get this resolved, I'd say, in the next quarter. So it's, it's just not good for anybody involved, I don't believe. So, yeah, Mark, I want to um, talk a little bit more about that strike. The writer strike has been ongoing. The SAG strike is at the front end. Uh, the last time you had strikes of this capacity, you know, when we're going back to the 80s or 2000, you had three to six months. If this is a six-month strike, if it's even longer, uh, how well is Netflix positioned in terms of its content to be able to just sustain the platform and sustain, you know, continued revenue growth? Yeah, it's not it's not insulated. Um, I and there was I know there was some discussion about how much of their content is generated overseas, and there's no question like some of these um, shows like Squid Games that are just monster hits for the company. That's all outside of the U.S. And I don't think the writers of the the Screen Actors uh, Guild uh, strike would impact their ability to, ability to roll the next season. Next, yeah, the next season of, of Squid Games. But still, the, the, there is a large amount of content that, uh, on their slate that's going to be negatively impacted if the writer strike, uh, strike uh, continues. So, yeah, it's an issue, again, for all of the studios. It's an issue for Netflix. It is interesting just how dramatically entertainment has changed since the last major strike. I mean, streaming wasn't even in the, you know, a gleam in the eye uh, back then. And now... Uh, Netflix is, you know, fighting with YouTube to be the single largest screen time, uh, you know, really of all studios. So, um, you know, congrats to Netflix on what they've done over the last 20 years. But they need to resolve, and as the, as the other studios do, they need to resolve the strike. Yeah, whereas YouTube, it's not so reliant on that, uh, on, uh, that kind of produced content. Um, Mark, you mentioned at the beginning that expectations were super high going into Netflix, and you mentioned some of the other companies you cover. I am curious since this is just the leading edge of all of those companies, what your top pick is going into these uh, earnings that you cover? Well, so we uh, our top pick is Uber. Second pick is Amazon. Third pick is um, Meta. And we think with Uber, we got a couple of value catalysts coming up. This company finally hit positive free cash flow last year. Um, this year, we think in the back half of the year, they'll start hitting positive gap earnings um, uh, on profitability. And then I think they're going to start buying back stock. And I think they'll then be in, in that kind of club that could be included in the S&P 500. So you've got kind of three value catalysts. Amazon, I think, is at an inflection in terms of AWS cloud computing growth in the back half of the year. And they should be a good derivative off of all these AI workloads. And then Meta, I know it's had a monster run year to date, kind of like Netflix. But Meta trades still at 17 times earnings. It's still I think the cheapest of the high quality tech names out there. So yes, it's still a long for us. It's a third pick.